Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on supporting LGBTQ youth and virtual spaces. Happy Pride Month to everyone. I am Jamima St. Louis, and I am an associate professor in the clinical psychology department and the co-director of the Center for Multicultural and Global Mental Health at William James College. This webinar is co-hosted with the Dean of Students Office and the Rainbow Alliance at the college, as well as a partnership with Boston Glass in Bagley. We are living in unprecedented times amid the current COVID-19 pandemic and a pandemic of institutional racism and systemic discriminatory policies and practices that have for more than 400 years created and sustain significant disparities which have disproportionately affected the lives of ethnic, racial, and sexual minorities throughout this country. One of the priorities of the Multicultural Center during these times of social political unrest is to ensure that we can continue to provide a platform to bring concerned citizens together in order to raise awareness about the unmet needs of underserved communities, strengthen existing networks of allies, and continue to advocate for resources and services that are needed in order to promote the mental health and well being of historically marginalized individuals, families, and communities, not only locally, but nationally and across the globe. So to that end, we are pleased to have two of our esteemed colleagues, Akane Kuminani and Galena Smith, who will lead today's presentation. I am also joined by my colleague, Meredith Applebaum, who is the Assistant Dean of Students at William James College, who will introduce our guest speakers momentarily. First, I would like to go over just a few housekeeping items. In order to minimize or any type of interference in background noises, we ask that you please remain muted throughout the presentation. There will be a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Please feel free to post any questions or comments that you may have in the chat box. And if you feel comfortable, also share your name, the organization that you represent in the city, town, state, or country from where you are calling today. We would love to hear from you. Please note that copies of the PowerPoint documents, resources, and certificates of attendance will be sent via email to all registered participants by the end of this week. Feel free to contact us as our contact information will be shared with you in the chat box. Now, I would like to welcome my uh, co-host, Ms. Meredith Applebaum, who will introduce today's speakers. Meredith? Thank you, Dr. St. Louis, and thank you to the Center for Multicultural and Global Mental Health for spearheading today's webinar program. Uh, as, as Dr. St. Louis said, I'm Meredith Applebaum, Assistant Dean of Students and Staff Advisor for the Rainbow Alliance here at William James College. Through our Dean of Students office, we offer a range of services and programming with a focus on academic support, career development, community service, community building, and wellness. And our Rainbow Alliance provides support and advocacy for our LGBTQIA students, faculty, and staff through meetings, initiatives, and events. That said, it is my absolute pleasure to share the bios of our two speakers for this afternoon's webinar. Akane Komanami, LICSW, believes in the resilience of the LGBTQ communities of color and the power of being in the present moment and learning about self as essential tools for hearing and self-actualization. Born and raised in Japan, Akane identifies as a queer, transnational, multicultural, cisgender woman of color, an advocate for well-being of trans and queer people of color, a therapist, and a clinical social worker. Currently, Akane is the Behavioral Health Services Manager at Boston Glass at Justice Resource Institute, where she primarily works with LGBTQ plus young people of color and their families. And Galena Smith joined Bagley in August 2017 as the Health Programs Coordinator, where she works to maximize clinic efficiency and increase access to judgment-free sexual health care and education. Now, as the Health Program Manager, she also oversees Bagley's new mental mental and behavioral health program, which began in 2019. 
Prior to joining Bagley, Galena worked for Planned Parenthood of Southern New England as a clinic assistant. There, she was routinely involved in direct patient care, including phlebotomy, contraceptive care, and abortion support counseling and education. Galena has held leadership positions in Emerson Feminist Perspectives House and Wheaton College Women's Rugby Team. She was awarded the Landmark Leadership Award for Gender Equality by Wheaton College in 2016. Prior to moving to the Boston area, Galena also served on the Rawl Pro-Choice Connecticut's Political Action Committee. We will now hear from both of our wonderful speakers. Uh, but to our audience, I ask that you hold your questions until both speakers have completed their formal presentations. I would now like to turn the webinar, webinar over to our first speaker, Akane Komanami. Thank you, Mirabeau. Great, can everyone see this? Actually, I cannot see your face. I can't tell if people can actually see this. I'm gonna trust that this is working. Yes, we can see it. Oh, great. Thank you again for the introduction. And my name is Akane Kominami. My name in Japanese is Kominami Akane. I'm from Japan. My third person pronouns are she, her, hers. I identify as a queer cisgender woman of color. My role at GLASS is Behavioral Health Services Manager and a therapist. My presentation today covers introduction to GLASS, virtual GLASS services, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the LGBTQ youth of color, sharing youth voices literally where I'll be sharing you the recordings of two interviews I did with young people and additional resources. So you can see that I prepared this presentation to cover topics related to the COVID pandemic, but then the centuries old pandemic of black anti-black racism became really visible in a way I didn't predict. So I, as a, a known black woman of color, and as a program that is working with LGBTQ youth of color, I wanted to say something. First, I believe that Black Lives Matter. And when I say this, what I mean is that Black women's lives matter and Black transgender people's lives matter as much as Black cisgender men's lives matter. So all Black lives matter. And if this isn't something you've thought of before, this is the opportunity for you to start thinking more and start learning about your relationship with All Black Lives Matter. And if this is something you believe in already, let's keep it going. So let me talk about GLASS. GLASS stands for Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, Transgender, Adolescent Social Services. And we have two sites, one in Boston called Boston GLASS since 1995. And we also have Framingham Glass. It's a town in Massachusetts since 2018. Our motto is Be Here, Be You. Glass's mission is to provide the well being of, to improve the well being of LGBTQ youth of color. How do we do it? It's this. We do this by providing a continuum of services that addresses LGBTQ youth of color's immediate needs that equips LGBTQ youth of color with tools to make healthy decisions and live fulfilling lives, and to help create communities in which LGBTQ youth of color can thrive. So what are those services? Services we offer at GLASS include a mix of prevention services related to HIV and STI, mental health services, including individual therapy, and family therapy, and other social services, public health related services, and community education. How has COVID affected those services? Since March 16th, 2020, GLASS services has been offered, offered remotely, with exceptions of HIV and STI in-person testing, PrEP, and treatment. It is now offered by appointment only on site. Let me talk about virtual glass services. So we provide telehealth, 
therapy, through video conferencing, and phone. But then, some clients do not have the privacy they need. So we started text therapy. Here's how we do it. One glass text therapy is by appointment with established clients only, meaning we cannot accept brand new clients to just do text therapy. We made decision simply because we didn't have enough information and experience providing text therapy. So we didn't want to open this up for brand new people. And when people need that kind of services, we can refer people to other programs that are doing text-based support to brand new people as well. And it's synchronous, meaning the therapist and client will show up at the same time and agree to text through the hour of the appointment versus I send them one text and two hours later I hear back from them. We ensure appropriate clinical boundaries, meaning the only the client and the therapist read and write the text messages. Therapists identify the therapist self in the beginning and also confirm client's identity to start each session. And I usually just ask people to tell me the name they use with me in our relationship and their date of birth. We establish a safety plan to be followed by the client should the encounter be interrupted for any reasons. All health record and documentation standards must be met, including storage, access, and disposal of records. And lastly, we ensure to uphold our code of ethics. So that was glass therapy services. And now let me introduce you to virtual groups. We have 15 unique groups that we offer at glass currently. And those are just three of the examples. This is a group where young people play Dungeons and Dragons game with a facilitator. This is a group that is done by Framingham Glass open mic on Instagram. And Semias is a group for LGBTQ young people who identify as Latinx to get together. So that young people I interviewed who I'll be introducing you to later, will talk more about the groups in detail, so I will not go over too much about the groups right now. We also offer virtual drop-in center because we kept hearing from young people that one of the things they miss the most about GLASS is coming to the drop-in center and seeing staff members and other young people. So we created this program where three times a week for a couple of hours, we host virtual drop-in center on Zoom where people can access through our Facebook page and hang out with staff members and other young people who are members of GLASS like we did before. It's still not the same as the physical drop-in center, but we're hearing good feedback from young people. Four, we have safer sex and substance use harm reduction supplies. Primarily in Metro West Massachusetts region, we do free mail order of the supplies, which include condoms, syringes, chirps, containers, and other items like lube, gloves, dental bands, and Norcan. Additional services that's offered virtually include social media engagement that we sort of increased post pandemic to be more visible and easier for young people to find us. We provide health navigation through remotely, which means that we connect young people with primary care doctor and health insurance. We also mail grocery, gift cards, masks, and phones as needed. And this protest bag giveaways is not a virtual support we provide, it's actually in person. We go to, uh, some staff members go to local protests that are happening right now and distribute. Uh, protest bags filled with snacks and other items that are important for protest. To find out more about our groups, please visit our website. Now, how has COVID-19 affected our clients? Here are some of the wins. We're hearing that 
uh, people are experiencing increased opportunities for caregivers and young people to practice the skills they learned through family therapy. Increased access to certain LGBTQ resources and groups globally. Now that things, more things are offered online and young people are getting more skilled at accessing those services. Increased time to work on personal goals. Increased opportunity for exploration of self-affirming gender expression. Better engaged in, in the therapeutic process for some people. It seems that for some of my clients, telehealth is easier to engage in than in-person settings. In-person setting might be a little too overstimulating for them. And finally, increased positive communication with partners and friends. And here are some of the challenges. We heard so many challenges, so I could not capture everything to fit in one slide here. And Galena will also address additional challenges and elaborate some more, as well as the young people who you will be seeing later. I just wanted to address some of the challenges. People are reporting the increased feelings of fear, anxiety, and depression. Increased time with household members with whom young people do not feel comfortable. And for young people, LGBTQ youth of color who are engaged in escorting, sex work, or uh, sexual exploitation, they're experiencing the increased safety concerns with less access to screened clients as clients are avoiding contacts right now. So it is hard for them to choose clients whom they feel comfortable with engaging in when there are fewer people out there. There's anxieties about being sick because of the immigration status, the public charge role, and the lack of health insurance experienced among LGBTQ youth of color who are immigrants. There's indefinite delays in gender affirming surgeries, name change, and a gender marker change and changes to sexual health strategies and access. For example, some clients on PrEP are afraid to come in for routine testing because of COVID-19. Now let's listen to young people. Hi everyone, my name is Naya. I use she, her, her pronouns. I am a peer leader at Boston Glass and an outreach specialist. I'm 20 years old. And I'm a Black trans woman. Thank you, Naya, for introducing yourself. So I'm curious about how COVID has impacted you. Can you speak a little bit on that? COVID has impacted me with, like, paying off bills and rent because I'm the only person, as of right now, who has, like, some type of employment going on. I don't make enough to pay off our rent. So, like, our landlord's been, like, over our heads about paying off the rent. The money that I make won't go towards me no more because then I would be able to fund myself because it'd go right to the bill. How many roommates do you have? There's six of us, but I live with five. And you are the only one who has a job right now, you're saying? Yeah. But everyone's been doing, like, crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. or like mutual aid groups or whatever but like that won't help like only so much can help uh, and I know there are some resources and support from Massachusetts and other services can you speak a little bit on you and other people's experience around it I did receive the stimulus check but like mm -hmm. it went straight to like to help me affirm my gender can you share with us a little bit about what that means for you when you say it, if you don't mind? When I say for my gender, I mean like buying undergarments, like makeup, stuff like that. It goes towards my transition to help me mm -hmm. feel more comfortable with myself. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean by affirming. Thank you so much for sharing that, Naya. You're welcome. Now, I'm really curious, can you speak on the work you've been doing as a GLASS peer leader since COVID-19? We've been doing everything virtually, online, either on Facebook Live, Instagram Live, or Beagle Live. So, for starters, I run a group called PRISM. It's a group that we used to have, what well, we had going on before COVID-19. It was really like people come to GLASS, 
pizza, eating, talking, eat pizza, or whatever food for that for that for that day. I mean, and so but the only hardship and like obstacle I'm not having is that it's very challenging seeing like trying to bring people in. People rather do things in person than online. How about successes? What's been working well for you and your work at Glass? For success, I have another group called Live Living Your Fears Every Day. L Y F E. That was a group we had we have at Glass, and that was basically it was every Wednesday around five to six, and everyone will come in, eat pizza, and talk and discuss about our topics for for that um for that day. It's a daily it's a daily thing. And so we decided to bring it online as well. And it's been really good. People are like been listening. Our topics were very really, like not controversial, but very spot on, but relevant as to where it's really relevant. People are tuned into it. People are interested and willing to learn more. And I think it's good. I like, I love that we're doing this online because when people are learning about Boston Glass, like, oh, I never heard of Boston Glass. Hopefully at the end of this, people are excited to come to Boston Glass more. I see. So for prisons, what platform are you using? We're using we're using Facebook. Okay. And how about for life? For life, we're using so far we use Instagram, Facebook, wow. and Beagle Live. Which one has been most successful? The most success has been on Instagram. So do you do Instagram Live? Yes. So basically, how it's set up is that there's me and another peer leader. Um, we facilitate together on the Instagram Live, and we read the comments and reply to the comments about the topic we have going on. We each have our own topics, so like sometimes my topic would be the opposite, or or we'll tie in with each other. I see. Can you share with me one of the recent topics y'all used?、Um, we talked about fat shaming and body shaming, and housing crisis.、Mm. How did people respond to those topics? Everyone loved that we was talking about it because it was so relevant and it was so real. And I guess to give everyone like a reality check of what's going on, because like like life is, is living your fear, so it's gonna be fearful. It's gonna be a little triggering. It's gonna be unfiltered and raw. Like、mm-hmm. if we give if we give like warnings, like if if you find these topics and like sensitive, take discretion, take space if you need to. Those topics sound really amazing and sounds like young people. Are also finding them important. Thank you. So that was Naya speaking, and here is L. So just so you know, this video is a little bit glitchy, not because your internet is acting up right now, but L and my internet when we did this interview was acting up a little bit. So hi, my name is L Martinez. I use they them pronouns, and I am a peer leader at Framingham Glass. Um, I would identify my race or ethnicity as Afro Latina.、Uh, I'm half white, half Puerto Rican,、um, and I would ID my, I guess, queer experience in a in a kind of multitude of different words.、Uh, I'm non-binary, pansexual, polyamorous,、uh, kink positive.、Um, I guess that's that's all that's coming up off the top of my head, but I'm sure there's many other words. <laughs> COVID nineteen impacted my life quite a bit.、Um, I technically haven't graduated, but、uh, I am a high school senior outgoing, so I should be headed to college. I don't know. If I'm going to be physically headed to college, <laughs> which I had a big adjustment to make.、Um, in terms of the work that I do, I do a lot of work work remotely, so I'm used to the webinars, not hours a day, <laughs> but like at least once a day. I'm used to having calls online, so it hasn't been as bad of an adjustment for me as for some other folks.、Um, Generally, I think it's just been difficult being disconnected from a lot of my kind of queer spaces and my friends, and、uh, not even with the senior week activities, but with a lot of the the councils and kind of youth groups I serve on coming to a close without being able to say goodbye to those folks in person, especially when we're scattered across the country, has been really difficult.
being a glass crew leader is my the, the best job I've had my entire life. Um, I absolutely adore this job. I feel so privileged to be in this position. Um, I've done a lot of different work for glass. Uh, when I came in, I started doing consent work. So uh, writing visuals, uh, coming up with content regarding consent. Um, I figured that going into COVID-19 and going into kind of the social isolation period, there would be a lot more exchanges happening online. Uh, so I wanted to get out in front of that and talk about consent with our followers to, to ensure that they were prepared to handle whatever conversations or photos are being exchanged. Um, I have kind of moved through doing a lot more consent-based work, continuing with those visuals. Um, I have been hosting Life uh, Thursdays 5 to 6 for Framingham Glass, which has been um, a group that centers uh, queer and trans folks of color, youth of color, um, and we discuss almost anything. Today we discussed uh, what solidarity looks like in terms of uh, finances and what the differences are between kind of having the security to invest in grassroots organizations versus having to make different choices. Um, and we've just, we've discussed a whole host of things. I think next week we're going to discuss maintaining relationships during COVID-19, which I'm really excited about. Um, it's just been a really great experience. I participate in screenings. Um, I have been hosting an open mic every month, which I absolutely adore. Uh, it's probably the favorite thing I get to do uh, is bring in all sorts of different folks to perform and allow people to perform spontaneously um, and spend time on my shifts reading and learning about queer and trans poets of color that are just so amazing. Um, so the open mic has definitely been my favorite, but I've just mm -hmm. felt... Like I've had so much freedom in, in the work I get to do and nothing feels off limits. Right now I'm doing a lot of research on uh, non-genital sex and what intimacy looks like outside of sex and uh, doing doing research on, on all of that. Uh, and it's been a really uh, great thing to be able to spend my time doing and invest in and build resources off of. I've been in all queer spaces before. I've never been in majority, almost entirely queer spaces of color. Um, it's really powerful. Um, and it's not something I've ever had kind of direct access to, nor been a, a leader in. Um, and I think in that way, I've grown a lot. Thank you. So this was Elle. Those young people are so amazing that after them talking, I really don't want to say anything. So let me just share some resources and wrap up my part of the presentation. So again, there are so many resources in the world and people are doing amazing work to support LGBTQ young people and LGBTQ young people of color in particular. So I just selected a, a few of them for you to start from and uh, look at. Trans Lifeline is a peer support service run by trans people for trans people, and they provide services uh, in multi multiple languages. Trevor Project is pretty big and provides crisis intervention and suicide prevention for LGBTQ youth, and they provide text-based support as well. The network LARED is a Boston-based program working with survivors, LGBTQ plus survivors of partners violence, and they also have a hotline. Miss Mayer is a transgender activist, a veteran of the Stonewall riots, a former sex worker and a survivor of the Atika State Prison. So if you've never heard of her or if you've been interested in learning more about her but you haven't had the opportunity, this is her website so you can start from there. And I encourage you to look her up more on Google and in the library. The Okra Project pays Black trans chefs to go into the homes of Black trans people to cook them a healthy and homemade meal for free. 
Transgender Emergency Fund of Massachusetts is currently led by a trans, queer trans woman uh, and supports low income and homeless transgender individuals in Massachusetts. Instagram handles. So since I've been working from home a lot, I've been spending a little more time on social media and I have come to love Instagram because of uh, the stories and the live Instagram lives people put together. So those are my top three recommendations. This Black Visions Collective, which is a Black trans queer led organization based in Minnesota. Laverne Cox, who is a, an actress, a documentary film producer, an equal rights advocate, and a public speaker. Alok Vaid Vaid Menon is a gender non-conforming writer and a performance performing artist who is an Indian American, South Asian. And those two people sometimes collaborate on Instagram as well, and their conversations are really amazing. So I highly recommend them. Thank you for listening to my part of the presentation and to contact myself or other GLASS staff members, please visit our website or follow us on our social media. Thank you, Okane. That was fantastic. So helpful and agreed. The exuberance of those peer leaders was just really lovely to witness. Uh, thank you for all those wonderful resources. So again, we were asking the audience to hold their questions until uh, the end of our next uh, presenter's presentation. Uh, we're now going to bring it to uh, Galena Smith from Bagley. Galena. Hi, everybody. My name is Galena. Um, thank you so much, Akane. That's a tough act to follow, so I'm going to be doing my best. Um, let me just go ahead and share my screen so we can get started. Okay, can everybody see that? All right, I'm yeah. seeing some nods, a thumbs up. Awesome. I will get started. So I wanted to do a brief land acknowledgement. Um, I'm coming at you live from Everett, Massachusetts, um, that is historically Wampanoag land. And I wanted to do that to honor the First Nations people um, who were here before us and who are still here. I also wanted to briefly introduce myself. My name is Galena Smith. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm Bagley's health programs manager. Um, and at Bagley, I'm responsible for the direct provision of HIV and STI testing services, as well as referrals for treatment and primary care. We work with a subcontract with Fenway Health, as well as a registered nurse who comes into our space a couple times a week. Um, we also, so in general, I also do, I also make sure that our mental health services are up and running, um, and I manage deliverables related to our health programming. My goal for today is to share the trends with you that we have noticed in our space um, since the beginning of isolation, as well as the strategies and resources we've used to address barriers that our young people are currently facing. Um, additionally, I want to be transparent with you all about the challenges and the successes that we've had during this time. Also, as a housekeeping rule, if you see me looking down, um, I'm reading my notes off of my phone, so I'm not ignoring you all. Okay, so Bagley is the Boston Alliance of Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, and Transgender Youth. We're youth-led and adult-supported. Um, what that means is that uh, our young people decide how to address the needs of their community, and we as adult staff help them get there either through programming, advocacy, or connection to resources. Um, we were founded in 1980, and Bagley is the longest-running LGBTQ youth organization in the country. Um, and we are currently celebrating our 40th year here in Boston. Um, our downtown, our community center is located in downtown Boston, and we serve about 30,000 young people per year. Additionally, Bagley is the fiscal sponsor of the Agley Network, which are sites across Massachusetts that provide similar services to Bagley. Um, we have 14 sites across Massachusetts, so we have Bagley in Boston, Nagley in the North Shore, Bragley in Brockton, um, and a variety of other sites that are spread across central and western Massachusetts. Bagley's programming um, is split into four broad categories. Uh, we have youth leadership, which includes the YLC and HEART, 
uh, the YLC is our Youth Leadership Committee, and HEART is our Health Education and Risk Reduction Team. Um, so there's about 15 peer leaders spread across the two teams who steer the direction of programming in our space. We also have Speakers Bureau, which is managed by one of our uh, colleagues. Um, and speakers, the goal of Speakers Bureau is to help young people um, sort of organize their personal life stories to, to do effective advocacy and storytelling. Um, and we also connect those young people to paid speaking opportunities, um, like panels in churches, um, visiting schools to talk to other, you know, other young people about their experiences. And also we connect them to corporate speaking opportunities as well. And we make sure that young people are trained properly and paid for their time. We also have health programming, which includes the clinic services that I manage, which again is um, HIV and STI prevention services, linkage to PrEP, linkage to primary care. Occasionally we do pregnancy related services as well, um, do a lot of risk assessment and counseling. Um, and we also have mental health services. They're new as of 2019, so we're still figuring out what methods work best for us. But right now the services that we offer are um, uh, closed group therapy, which is something that you have to sign up for ahead of time. And it's group therapy, it's spread over five weeks that addresses a certain topic. Um, we also have uh, narrative art therapy and a peer-led mental wellness group that's facilitated by a peer leader. Um, and we also have Tea Time, which is our um, Wednesday night therapy slots with our licensed independent social worker, Jesse. Um, so we have those services as well. Social programming for us includes identity meetings. So meetings based off of identity, such as women's meeting, POC meeting, trans meeting, etc. We also have Nerd Hour, which is not really based on identity, but time for people to talk about video games and other things that they, that they like to engage in. Um, and we also have our Wednesday night meetings. So Wednesday nights, um, every Wednesday of the month is a different themed programming. The first Wednesday of the month is Arts Corner. Second Wednesday of the month is family dinner, which looks a little bit different now in COVID times. Um, we also have open mic nights. And then on a fourth Wednesday of every month, the health education and risk reduction team puts on a presentation about health and safety for their peers in the space. Um, this month's uh, presentation is going to be about navigating digital intimacy and relationships. Um, so I'm really excited for that one. And lastly, we have large events. Um, one of my favorite events is the Trans Youth Summit. Um, and it's a day long summit for young people um, to be in community with one another, to gain resources and to skill build. It is specifically for trans young people age 24 and under. And we also have a parent track for the parents, guardians and caregivers of trans young people um, that is put on by PFLAG of Greater Boston. So we collaborate with them to do a youth track and a parent track. We also have Youth Pride, which is Bagley's answer to Boston Pride. Um, our Youth Pride is geared towards young people 22 and under, um, and it's a family-friendly, youth-oriented pride celebration um, that sort of uh, decenters de things like alcohol and corporate sponsorships to really bring it back to, to young people um, and make it more family-friendly and age-appropriate. Um, we also work with the New England ballroom community, the Boston and the local Boston ballroom community to put on the New England Awards Ball, which is a huge competition with really big prizes. Um, there's a lot of categories to walk. If you're not familiar with ball culture, um, I would encourage you to watch Pose, which is available on FX and Netflix. There are two seasons out right now. Um, and also to watch the film Paris is Burning. In the, um, I've, comp I've compiled a Google document that will be shared out with everybody after this webinar, um, which includes links to view trailers um, and also links to all the sources and resources I'm mentioning here. Lastly, we have Bagley's Prom. It is the first queer prom in the country and it's um, available for young people, 20, LGBTQ young people, 22 and under. Um, and it's a way for young people to experience prom safely if they didn't get to do that in high school um, in, a, in a queer or farming space. Okay, so I'd like to talk a little bit about what it was like for us to transition to virtual programming, um, both as organization and as and for young people. Um, we had about a week of downtime to conceptualize our new programming to purchase our zoom subscriptions um, and to update our website and gather resources. This week of downtime also gave young people the much needed break that they needed to be able to adjust um, and make plans for themselves. Um, as to whether or not they would be able to continue with their peer leadership roles or to, ad to adjust for their new realities as needed. Um, and we also gave support during that time also as needed. 
The things that most of our programming transitioned to virtual spaces largely unscathed. The things that did not make it, unfortunately, were the clinic services. Um, so most of my job did not make it into that virtual space. Um, so our in-person services like clinic services, as well as our closed group therapy, and a lot of our speakers bureau was put on, on hold during this time. Um, we found that establishing routine and normalcy was really important for young people during this time when normalcy was really scarce. Um, and we also had to kind of reimagine our group agreements. So at Bagley, we have the Bagley Freeze. Bagley is free of sex, drugs, alcohol, violence, peer pressure, and harassment. We had to think about how those things would transition well into a virtual space and specifically into like the Zoom, the Zoom meeting space. Um, virtual agreements now include guidelines um, such as knowing you know how to mute your microphone um, being mindful of what's in the video video frame so for example um, if you have something in the video frame that's going to violate one of the bagley freeze we ask you to remove it uh, we've had to ask people to young people to put on clothes to make them to make themselves more presentable for the screen or to remove clothing that was inappropriate um, we've also had to adapt guidelines that account for lag and awkward silences not everybody's Wi-Fi works the same way or not everybody's Wi-Fi is as seamless as others. Um, so we've really had to do a lot of facilitation training, um, including practicing and role play with our facilitators, our youth facilitators, um, to make sure that they were able to account for lag um, for, uh, for the, in, you know, to account for the internet and Wi-Fi usage of others so that people whose Wi-Fi is not as strong are able to fully participate um, in our programming. So making sure that we take times to pause and take time for other people to be able to absorb the audio and video that's being shared. Yeah, so I'd like to talk now about broad challenges. Um, all of the issues that we were already working to fix in the LGBTQ youth community um, that were already there have not changed. They've only been exacerbated as a result of COVID-19. Um, so nothing new necessarily, but still a lot of mental health challenges, unemployment challenges, um, additional risk of COVID-19 exposure, housing instability, increased risk of bullying or abuse, as well as health disparities. Um, I want to talk first a little bit about mental health challenges. So in general, LGBTQ young people are at higher risk for anxiety, depression, substance use, suicide, and suicidality. Um, this is especially high in trans young people um, as compared to cisgender heterosexual counterparts. Um, so, and we know that a lack of community increases isolation and feeling isolated really increases the risk of feeling these types of feelings. Um, so we wanted to make sure that young people still had a community space, even if it was virtual, to sort of make sure that they still felt what, like they were in community and not as isolated. Um, also, unemployment and exposure are kind of two, two sides of the same coin here. Um, we know that there are an estimated 5 million LGBTQ people in essential service jobs or in heavily impacted industries such as food service and retail. Um, and so we know that in a lot of ways, um, young people are either facing unemployment and thus, you know, financial instability, or they are having to work in, in what has been deemed as essential service jobs and are now at greater risk for COVID-19. Um, financial instability can also lead to housing instability. Um, LGBTQ youth are more likely to experience housing instability as a, or homelessness as a result of familial rejection and increased economic strain. Um, closures of community centers like ours have been especially devastating for young people who are experiencing homelessness because they used our community centers to charge phones, change clothing, um, you know, have a snack, maybe apply, apply personal hygiene, um, use computers, etc., apply to jobs, you know, get resume help, that sort of thing. So clo the closure of community centers has been really difficult, um, especially for those experiencing homelessness. Um, we know that housing is health and health is housing and when um, you add financial instability into that it's a, it's a really difficult um, situation to be in. Yeah and I also want to talk about increased risk of bullying or abuse. A lot of our young people um, or young people in general um, are housed or currently isolating with support unsupportive or abusive family members or intimate partners um, and being being with those people for um, an indefinite amount of time poses a really huge health risk both, me both mental health and physical health to our young people and our clientele 
Um, and in general, health disparities um, are still present and are now being exacerbated as a result of COVID-19. So LGBTQ youth and adults have historically avoided going to the doctor due to cost barriers and discrimination like misgendering or denying care on the basis of sex. And we know that with the new HS HHS rule that that is now legal in the United States because they have because the Trump administration has changed the way that the 1557 sections um, can be interpreted and now discrimination on the basis of sex is legal in the United States. Um, and unfortunately, the new SCOTUS ruling does not nullify that, that rule. <clears throat> so, and I'd just like to drive the point home that COVID-19 COVID has not necessarily changed any of these pre-exist, or changed the nature of these pre-existing barriers, um, but have only exacerbated them quite a bit. Great, so I'd like to talk about specific challenges um, that we've noticed at Bagley and that we've run into quite often. Um, like Akane was mentioning, not every young person has access to a private space or confidential spaces to be able to engage with therapy sessions. Um, so we use encrypted video call sites like DoxyMe and not Zoom um, to be able to offer video therapy if needed. Um, and we also have chat options available so that in the event that um, young people are at risk of being overheard, that they are able to enter, enter text into a chat and um, our therapist um, can respond to them in real time. Um, similar to Glasses Therapy Services, our therapy services are also synchronous. Um, also within the last month, this is not a new thing by the way, but within the last month we realized that with more people accessing our website um, and needing confidentiality, um, we decided to ad add a leave site button to the header of our website so that if somebody is accessing our website and somebody comes in the room or stands over their shoulder, they can just hit the leave site button and it'll take them to the weather channel. Um, you know, it's a good tool to be able to implement so that people can leave, leave um, websites that could get them, in, you know, put them in a dangerous position um, later on. So that is new as of this month for us. I also, um, Wi-Fi access, like I said, is a really difficult thing to navigate during this time, especially for young people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, with everything being digital right now, it's really difficult to make sure that all of our young people are able to um, access our services the same way when not everyone has access to Wi-Fi. Um, because our community center is closed and we are we do not have the capacity to be giving out or mailing out um, our material supports, access to food and gender affirming wear, personal hygiene items, um, safer sex materials like condoms or dental dams, um, and risk reduction materials like masks during this time have been really limited on our end and that's been really impacting our young people, unfortunately. Also, Zoom bombing and trolls. I don't know if anyone else has experienced this, um, but Zoom bombing is when um, people, bad actors, try and enter into a Zoom space that is for a specific reason and then disrupt that, that space. Um, we've noticed specifically at Bagley that our women's meeting and our trans meeting has been most heavily impacted by, um, by Zoom bombing and by trolls. Um, it, when we first started, we did not have passwords or a screening tool. Um, so we would just let anyone who came into the waiting room into the meeting and then they would sit through names and pronouns and then try and disrupt the meeting by sh either sharing graphic imagery or yelling or screaming slurs. Um, our staff have been really good about cutting that off before anything you know truly, truly disruptive or harmful could happen. Um, but that has caused us to implement a screening tool um, that needs to be filled out by young people. And then young people must um, have a video chat or some kind of chat to, with a staff member to confirm that they are who they say they are. And then they receive the passwords to all of our programming. Um, so, that, so that's been really helpful. And we've actually gained a lot of, a lot of new um, Bagley, general, general Bagley membership that way. But it's, you know, it's definitely created um, more work for staff people I and mean, it's work that we're happy to do to keep our young people safe. But, you know, just just to be really clear, if you're looking, if you or your organization is looking to implement these things, um, it will it will mean increased staff time um, in meetings that used to run without any staff involvement or minimal staff involvement in our community center space now require two staff, one to help with facilitation and another to do security and tech support. That also means getting real comfy with Zoom. All right, great. I get to talk about Bagley's successes now, which is exciting. Um, we have had over 10 new attendees in the past couple of months um, join our Bagley general membership and join our meetings, which is awesome. Um, we 
adapted the screening tool to be used by young people so that um, you know, not only can staff verify that young people are indeed young people and want to join our programming, but also it gives us a chance to meet young people, make a connection with them, and also introduce them to the Bagley Freeze and the virtual facilitation guidelines so that we are able to, so that they are able to access our spaces in a way that um, maximizes the benefits that they get from, from those spaces. Yeah, um, we've also had a diversified geographic reach. So now that travel is not not optional to our space anymore, um, you know, we've had a lot of young people from different cities across Massachusetts and beyond, some as far as Philadelphia, um, and occasionally people from the West Coast. So I'm really, um, really excited that we've been able to broaden our geographic reach. And also our Youth Pride event did move to a virtual space. Um, and instead of one day uh, at City Hall Plaza where we did a Youth Pride celebration, we decided to have a week, a week of events kind of packed into our normal programming. Um, it included a sexual health Q&A, a Bagley history lesson with Grace Sterling Stowell, who is our executive director, um, and a variety of other events like a fashion show and a drag show, um, sort of packed into our, in between our regular programming to really emphasize youth pride. And the reach for that was really great. We not only reached a bunch of new young people and a lot of our, you know, our fans and people that follow us on Facebook, um, but we also engaged with alumni. So people who previously came to Bagley, you know, for the past 40 years and have since aged out. Um, so that was a really, really wonderful um, experience for us. Um, we've also been uh, promoting our direct aid program. So our direct aid program is a program, app, you know, it's an application monetary, it's an application based monetary aid program. Um, and so far we've dispersed $14,000 to approximately 120 LGBTQ young people across the country. 75% um, of those young people identified as young people of color and that um, that was mostly in the form of Amazon gift cards. Um, and some of that money was money we were able to just give away. And some of that money was tied to um, contractual obligations. And so because we could not just give that money to applicants, we had to tie it to work. And so we would ask young people to like tag themselves in like a Bagley, um, you know, Bagley flyer or share a post on Facebook or share a hashtag. So that way it was a really low barrier ask. We could still, we could still fulfill our contractual obligation and still give them the aid that they needed for a very, a very small ask you know, in order to reduce barriers. Right, so I wanted to talk now about the work that we have yet to do. Um, as we know, there are two pandemics happening in America right now. Police brutality, which has been happening for 400 years, we could argue, um, and COVID-19, which is new to us as of 2019. Um, the, this moment and the convergence of these two pandemics um, is a, in, requires a special, you know, special understanding and, and I would say, you know, an interest in supporting LGBTQ young people in the ways that they need to be supported. Um, the same neighborhoods and people that are highly impacted by COVID-19 are also the same neighborhoods that are impacted by police brutality. The next slides will have some visuals to sort of support that. Um, but LGBTQ people and Black LGBTQ youth um, are at that intersection. They're navigating that intersection of oppression. So it's really important that we're able to help them during this time. Um, I was listening to D WBUR a couple, couple days ago, and um, I can't remember the program or the guest speaker who said it, but um, she went on to share this adage from the African American community that says, when white America catches a cold, black America gets pneumonia. And she was using that to illustrate specifically COVID, you know, how COVID-19 is affecting um, black and African American communities in the United States. Um, but this, you know, talking about how they've been disproportionately affected by COVID-19, but this can be applied pretty much anything to economics, to public health, to racist policing policies. Um, this is not just about COVID-19. So what I'm sharing with you now is a screenshot from an interactive map that I found um, on the Boston Globe's website. Um, this interactive map shows COVID cases um, in each in each uh, zip code in Massachusetts, um, and if you'll come, oops, there we go. And if you look, that little red dot is Chelsea, Massachusetts, and it's next to a lighter orange spot, and that's Everett, Massachusetts. Um, Everett and Chelsea are COVID epicenters in Massachusetts, and these are also near, uh, these are also zip codes um, with large uh, black and brown communities and, and people living there. 
right? So COVID, and we know that COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting these, um, these communities and these neighborhoods as a result of um, occupational exposure, people working in essential service jobs like janitorial jobs, warehouse jobs, um, food service, food packing in warehouses, Amazon delivery, hospital jobs, et cetera, and LGBTQ youth are not exceptions. So I wanted to just bring this, you know, bring this closer to Boston to um, sort of explore how this works, you know, just in Boston. And you'll see that the trend is the same here. So um, neighborhoods that are predominantly black and brown, like Roslindale, East Boston, Dorchester, Roxbury, South End, Hyde Park, Mattapan, um, all of these places are experiencing higher rates of COVID-19. Um, this is from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, but I took it off of the Boston Public Health Commission's website. Um, they have a weekly report on COVID-19 in, in the city of Boston. Um, so as you can see, these neighborhoods are disproportionately affected by COVID-19 cases and deaths. Oops, sorry. Please hold. All right, here we go. So I wanted to make the connection between COVID-19 and police brutality, mostly because I've noticed that a lot of the same people that are affected by COVID-19 are and are affected by police brutality are now the same people that are organizing protests and organizing movements for social change across the United States. Um, that seems really unfair to me that young people and that people who are already disproportionately affected by public health and racist policing policies are now having to do the work of um, organizing for social change. So I just wanted to talk about this graph I pulled from the Black, Brown, and Targeted report um, released by the ACLU in Mass um, ACLU of Massachusetts in 2015. Um, it shows that 24.4% um, of Boston's population is made up of Black or African American people. Um, I'm not using Black and African American interchangeably here because they mean different things in different contexts. Um, and I also wanted to point out that um, 63.3% of uh, police and civilian interactions um, have been with police and Black or African American individuals. So you can see that these people are also being over, these communities are being over policed um, in the same way that they're being um, uh, disproportionately affected by COVID-19. So I guess the question that begs now is what are we doing to um, immediately support our young people besides name and pronouns, right? Besides respecting mandatory name and pronouns, what are we doing to provide material support or to provide emotional support so that young people can continue navigating these, these spaces in, this, in these moments in history safely? Um, you know, I, I tend to think that safety planning is a really great way of making sure that we can provide support if some material support is not, um, not available through our, ourselves or our organizations. Um, safety planning can be used for anything. So it can be used for suicidality. It can be used to protect yourself against COVID-19. It can be used for protesting. Um, if a young person is engaging in sex work, you can help them do safety planning to engage in sex work safely. Um, so there's a lot of things that safety planning can be used for. The cornerstones of safety planning are research and preemptive thought. Um, so and that, and that helps young people sort of avoid having to make um, split second decisions uh, in the moment. So some questions I'd like to share with you all um, about safety planning are specific to COVID-19, but can be adopted um, and adapted for anything. Um, so one example of a question is to ask a young person to make a list of the things that they're doing to keep themselves safe um, and ask them what they would like to add to that list or if it's possible. Um, also, you can ask young people if they've had conversations with those close to them about how to keep themselves safe. Um, and you can ask them why or why not they may have had these conversations. Um, that's a great way of sort of opening up um, that thought process a little bit and also understanding if they feel safe enough at home or wherever they are with roommates or intimate partners to have those conversations or to know if they have the tools to start those conversations. Um, yeah, so that's one. So that's another way that they could be um, they could be supported in safety planning. And um, I have more examples of questions that are gonna be, that are in the Google Doc that I put together that'll be shared out after this webinar. Um, additionally, referrals to material support. If you or your organization is not handing out um, safer sex supplies or risk reduction supplies or harm reduction supplies at this time, know where young people can access those things and help them make a map of their area that includes all of those areas that are, or includes all those sites that are giving out material support. Um, in addition, 
and additionally having them know how to access those things. It's not enough just to tell a young person, oh, go to this address and you'll get you'll get these free things. Sometimes you need to really really bridge the gap there, bridge the gap in understanding and make sure that they understand how to access the material supports that they need. For example, um, we are not doing any kind of COVID testing at this time or any kind of HIV or STI testing at Bagley at this time. So when um, somebody accesses our clinic email or our clinic area or reaches out to know where they can get tested, um, I make sure to not only have conversations with them about what is open during this time, but also you know, reminding them that walk-ins are, are largely not available during this time or explaining that to them how to use their health insurance in a way that is confidential or explaining how a sliding fee scale works and where they may land on a sliding fee scale. Um, so it's, it's not just enough to, to tell them where to access things, you also have to teach them how. And sometimes they teach you stuff. I mean, that happens a lot too, that you find out things that you didn't know previously. Um, I also just wanted to mention um, how important it is to connect young people to culturally, culturally specific support systems. If you are not equipped for whatever reason to engage in care with a young person, enlist somebody who can to ensure that you are not causing any more harm, right? If you don't know a lot about a topic and a young person is asking you, either do the research ahead of time or enlist somebody who is able to do that. Um, paying black facilitators at this time is a really good way to make sure that your black youth are supported um, and that you are contributing to the livelihoods of other black individuals. All right. So lastly, advocacy, and I'm gonna kind of merge paying young people for the time and advocacy into the same example. Um, but I wanted to talk about an example, um, a former youth worker that I knew um, was the head of a summer work program at a local youth serving organization in the greater Boston area. And the summer work program did not pay an hourly wage to the youth employees that were completing work for this program. Um, Knowing that underserved youth are systematically barred from unpaid internships and work experiences as a result of you know, a lack of financial support elsewhere, um, this youth worker advocated for youth workers to be paid when completing work hours for this program. And she did this by threatening to resign. Um, and so she literally put her own salary on the line to make sure that youth workers were getting paid. This is an excellent way to advocate for young people who are benefiting or maybe not from your organization. Um, so ultimately, this got the attention of leadership at this organization and young people were paid for their time and she kept her job. So that's one, that is one way, that is one example of advocacy at an organizational level to ensure that um, equitable practices are instilled in that organization. Um, I also just want to talk briefly about an organizational donation matching program. If for whatever reason material supports are not being offered to young people during this time or you're not an organization that does that sort of direct aid, um, consider bringing up to your colleagues or your supervisors the idea of an organizational matching program. Um, one example of that is that um, employees would submit any kind of private um, donations that they've made and the organization would match it match those donations to those same charities um, there's a lot of versions in the way that this could be done but that's one one um, example of it and in general advocacy requires being um, able to have uncomfortable conversations that you may not normally with your colleagues and your supervisors in order to enact institutional and structural change okay so that is the end of my presentation um, and I will let Meredith and Jamima take it from here. Galena, fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing all of truly the amazing work that Bagley uh, is doing uh, during this time of, of COVID-19. You've been able to transition so much into the virtual space. So thank you for sharing all of that with us. I now want to uh, open this up to uh, our uh, audience to ask questions of uh, both of these fantastic speakers, both Galena and Akane. Uh, so what I'm gonna recommend uh, to uh, streamline this process is if you have a question, uh, and I noted there was someone that asked a question already and, and we'll be sure to, to highlight that one, uh, but just if you could type your name in the chat um, and then we can call on you, I can call on you and you can, you can ask your question. Um, and you can, I believe, unmute yourself to ask the question when I call on you. So um, what I'll do is I'll get started with the question that was already asked. And uh, if you have a question, as I said, just um, chat your name to us. Type your name in the chat box uh, and, and uh, we can call on you uh, when we see that your name is in the chat box. 
So there was one question that came in uh, from M. Victor. Uh, is Bagley doing the art therapy or is it hosted by someone else? Can you talk more about what you are doing for art therapy? So that's for Galena. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so the structure of our mental health programming, like I said, is new. Um, and so we're still figuring out the best way to provide therapy services. However, right now we are working with um, a licensed independent social worker. Their name is Jesse Begangi. Begangi. And they, um, so they've, we've had a long standing relationship with Jesse. Um, and now they work with us at a, at a sort of a contractor level to provide these services um, virtually. So it is, it is through Bagley because we have a, we have a working relationship with Jesse, but Jesse is the facilitator for that narrative art therapy group. And the way that the, the, the specific structure of that program um, is sort of decided both with young people and with Jesse. So um, at every art therapy session, Jesse sort of pulls, you know, takes a temperature check, pulls the room and says, you know, what, what types of things do we want to talk about for the next art therapy session? Um, and they're also once a month, so there's plenty of time for brainstorming. And then a prompt is released, usually the week before the art therapy group is is scheduled to happen um, and so young people sort of work off of that prompt and whatever medium they or whatever media they would prefer um, and then they bring what they've made to that narrative art therapy group and then the there's sort of like a show and tell portion and then a discussion discussion based um, you know discussion based part of the the group and um, I'm blanking on topics that have been shared during that time but you know one was like it was having something to do with expressing gender. So like, please make something or draw something or create something that um, expresses your gender or your multiple genders. Um, you know, and we've had a lot of like tree of life activities. So that, that sort of thing. I'm sorry, I wish I knew more about it, <laughs> more specific. That's great, Galena, thank you. We, uh, Christina Knowles has a question. Christina, you can unmute yourself, yes? And, and go ahead and ask the question. Christina, are you still there? Uh, Christina cannot unmute. Oh, oh wait, I think I was unmuted now, sorry. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, ask your question. Um, hi, so my name's Christina. Um, I just had a question about a uh, way to do this, you know, somewhat independently, uh, providing like, these online spaces for, LGBTQ youth because um, I used to do program coordination, um, but my university was impacted by, um, you know, COVID and uh, my contract was not renewed. So I'm trying to do this kind of on my own. Um, and I'm not sure really if that's like possible, like if I just like create an Instagram account and post information or, you know, I was wondering if you have any, if either of you have any information on this. Thank you. Hi, this is Akane. Um, I'm actually having those conversations, very similar conversations about individually supporting LGBTQ plus young people um, in Japan. And um, the short answer is it seems possible. And sort of the barriers or something to think about would be around funding, uh, human resources, very literally, and uh, also sort of liability issues and who's basically going to protect you and who are going to be in charge of also protecting the young people who would work with you. So those are some of the questions that I think we have to always think about whether doing this individually or as part of an organization but and also one way in which i'm seeing that people do a version of it like you suggested uh, making a social media account is to use social media to do different types of advocacy and support and so that might not necessarily look like um, providing one-on-one -on -one mentorship or providing mental health services, but people are on social media looking for things to do, people to follow. So creating your own 
sort of professional account for this purpose. Sounds like a great idea to me. Yeah, I just wanted to chime into that. Um, I mean, Bagley started as a group of LGBTQ young people meeting in a church basement. Um, so that's very informal, very grassroots. Um, and it, I think it depends on the direction that you want to take this group. I mean, we all we all receive support in some way, right? Whether if it's the group chat with our friends or attending Bagley's programming. Um, the thing I would, I you know, if I were in your shoes, I would encourage you to think about is like, who your, who your demographic would be and if there's already services in that area um, or, or services that are already working to, looking to work with that demographic to see if you could um, potentially contribute to those services or expand on them. Um, you know, and I also think something I'm thinking a lot about right now as a white person is um, thinking about how I take up space uh, virtually and physically um, and how I'm going to be contributing and letting black leaders lead. Right, so if you were to looking to start a group for Black LGBTQ young people, um, you may you may find that there are other people more qualified to do so, et cetera. So I guess I would sort of think about who your audience is and what types of services are you repeating services or are you expanding on services um, and filling a gap. That's great. I see we also had a similar question to kind of piggyback off of that from uh, for, forgive me if I mispronounce your name. It's Vigni Fong. When using the social media for groups, how do you ensure that it's a safe space for everyone? What do you do in particular to ensure the safety of the space? Either one of you. <laughs> yeah, so, um, I mean, like I said, we had a lot of Zoom bombing, a lot of trolls, um, and we've had to create a screening tool, which sort of asks demographic questions of young people um, without divulging too much personal information and also like preferred names and pronouns. Um, also, I like to say that um, names and pronouns of young people are not preferred, they are mandatory, but you know, we ask people what they call themselves um, and we ask them to sort of fill out how they heard about Bagley because that usually indicates to us um, if somebody was referred by a friend or found it through an internet search or if they are just trolling. Um, so again, the screening tools are, have been really important for us. Um, as well as having like sort of like a whisper network or, um, you know, having young people reach out to their networks and vouch for vouch for other young people who are looking to um, join our programming. That's been also hugely important. Um, and once people are in an actual space, um, we have to, we do go over our virtual facilitation guidelines as well as the Bagley freeze. Um, and, a, you know, one way that is used by facilitators quite often to make sure that spaces are, are safe spaces for everybody um, is to have um, groups come up with community guidelines themselves. So like one example of that is having the group come up with their own definition of respect. What does respect look like in this space, right? So that's, you know, um, creating community guidelines is one way that you can ensure a safe space. I'd also like to say that Bagley uses brave space guidelines, um, which sort of builds on safe space guidelines. So an example of that is that safe spaces say that it's okay to disagree, um, but in a brave space setting, we say, um, you know, examine your own biases, because um, sometimes agree to disagree allows people to say harmful things and then back off or, or disagree with another person that maybe received that harm. Um, and in, in brave space spaces, we want to make sure that um, people are really examining their intent and examining their impact and examining their biases and why they may have said something, why they disagree with something. So those are, those are some ways that you can ensure that people are, are safe. Thank you, Galena. If I can add a couple of things. Uh, at GLASS, we also do screenings. We, people have to complete a quick form stating their age, basic demographic information because our services are for youth of color who are LGBTQ. Um, and also on our website, we list groups and contact information for each group. So it is possible for young people to just access groups directly through our Facebook, Instagram, and other social media. But usually people contact staff members, appoint people first, so we can have a conversation there to make sure people know what to expect, who this group is for. Um, and we have been fortunate enough not to have experienced really terrible things, but I 
I think it's really important that we're always thinking about safety of the young people we work with. Thank you, Vinny. Thank you both. It, uh, we have another question from uh, Alois, Alois Onisi. Alois, you can ask the question, you can unmute yourself. Are you still on the call? I can see it in the chat so I can read it if that's helpful. Ah, uh, I see. Yes. The, uh, so my question goes to Galena. How, right, how does uh, your organization deal uh, with stig stigmatization and labor laws that protect the community of the LGBTQ? Uh, Alois is calling us from Kenya. Here in Kenya, the law does not protect the group. Galena? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, I'll start with labor laws. I don't know a lot about labor laws um, or the history of, of labor laws, but um, you know, in Massachusetts specifically, we uh, make sure that we pay our peer leaders um, $15 an hour. That was the new minimum wage that was enacted. Um, but instead, and we, we had the option of doing like a slow, increase um, but we just decided to go right to 15 to in order to minimize our, our budgetary um, our budgetary lift so um, in that way you know we pay our young people for their for their work and for their services um, so that is one way that we we make sure that they are um, being compensated and that also that means that we are following labor laws um, you know a, a very fresh SCOTUS ruling ruled that um, you cannot be fired from your workplace for being LGBTQ, for being trans. Um, so that's also really important, and but that's not necessarily a concern at Bagley because obviously we would never fire somebody for that for that um, type of thing. So that's not, you know, that doesn't necessarily pertain to us, but is really great, you know, is a really great thing that America, um, I think, is going to have to start enacting. Um, but yeah, and dealing with stigmatization, I guess it depends on this on stigma that you're talking about. And you know, you, there's HIV stigma, STI stigma, testing stigma. Um, you know, and I think honestly, the best way to do that is exposure, um, you know, exposure therapy for the, the rest of the world, I guess. And um, um, really sharing stories is a really wonderful way to beat stigma. Um, you know, photo campaigns. Um, I'm sorry, I can't really think of, of more specific examples at the, at the moment, but um, really just, you know, not hiding and sharing information. Akane, did you want to add anything to that? Um, maybe not super directly answering your question, but again, I'm thinking about Japan as I live in the United States and things, I look at the country I'm from, from the outside, outsider's perspective now, although I still feel really connected to the, the people and the culture. And the atmosphere and the environment surrounding LGBTQ plus people in Japan is very, very, very different from the United States. And I, I know I cannot just say the USA is this whole big one thing has no differences. Um, but speaking of Japan and the U.S., it's just very different in Japan. And so labor law is one thing. And what I'm seeing in Japan is they just work on bigger legal issues that they can work on. They, as in the organizers, lawyers, um, activists, advocates, they just pick one thing that's, that can be really visible to the bigger community in mainstream Japan and work on it, keep working on it, and hope that changing this one thing would impact other things to change. And right now that is in Japan is a um, marriage for all campaign. And there is a big lawsuit going on against Japan to make a marriage of all types in terms of gender identity and sex sign of birth legal. Thank you, Kane. Uh, and I, I, I would be remiss if I um, uh, didn't underscore something that Galena said, because this is a big deal in the United States on Monday. That was a groundbreaking landmark case. Uh, just this past Monday, the ruling came down that uh, across the country, you can no longer be fired 
on the basis of your sexual orientation or transgender identity. And uh, yeah, huge applause for that. So uh, some good news for a change in these times uh, of such challenge. So we wanted to make sure that we sat on that for a moment and, and, uh, and celebrated that. And I wanted to add that back in 1995, I actually was an intern in Washington, D.C. myself, living on Capitol Hill, interning with what at the time was Human Rights Campaign Fund, and it's since we all know them now as the Human Rights Campaign. And that was something uh, we were working on and talking about back then, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act in 1995. So it takes time. It takes time, but change happens. Good change happens. So um, that's really, it's, it's fantastic. So... Um, uh, in the interest of time, we want to make sure that um, everyone uh, who we want to try to give people as many people a, a chance as possible to ask a question. Uh, uh, so, um, Aloy, I hope that that was helpful for you. Um, uh, we can certainly, I know that um, if it's okay, Galina and uh, Kane have shared their emails. We have some further discussion if people have further questions. It looks like Aloy might have some follow-up questions uh, in contact after the, 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 the presentation. Uh, I'd like to move on. Jocelyn Jackson, uh, looks like Jocelyn has a question. Jocelyn, are you still on the call with us? You can unmute yourself and ask the question. Jocelyn is unable to unmute. I went ahead and unmuted you, Jocelyn. Oh. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a couple questions. Um, I might have missed this, but for your organizations, are they ran through grant funding um, in order for it to keep going? And then as far as for Galena, I know you said that you guys have a direct aid program. And I wanted to check in on if there's deadlines and how often are those programs being offered? That's a really good question. Um, I'm, for some reason, I'm only remembering the last part, which is about the direct aid. Um, I think we recently closed our direct aid applications because we were inundated both with a lot of really legitimate applications and then a lot of spam. Um, so right now we're taking time to go through those. And um, if you're willing to, you're welcome to email me and I can follow up with our marketing and development team who put together that direct aid and give you that information. I know that right now the Aqua project is um, doing small like micro grants for um, black trans individuals um, if those are clientele that that you work with then you may you could direct them to also to the aqua project who are giving out many grants during this time and i'm sorry what was the other part of your question oh i was just asking about uh, both programs so are they ran by grant funded programs in order to keep the business going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll let you answer since I've been doing a lot of talking. Uh, GLASS is, majority of funding for GLASS comes from grants. And we have a little bit of funding coming from our in-home family therapy program where we're billing insurance, but that's a very small portion and almost all funding for us comes from different grants. We also do have a donation page on our website, but uh, we don't solicit donation to run programs per se, but the donations we solicit go towards purchasing food and items that aren't covered through grants that are important for young people. Same here. We are almost entirely grant funded. Um, grant, you know, private grants, grants from the state of Massachusetts. Um, at the moment, I don't think we receive any kind of federal funding, um, and also private donors and private private family funds. 
Great, thank you both. Uh, we have time, I think, for one last question. Anyone want to ask our final question? You just type your name in the chat. I'll call on you. Or you can type your question. Actually, since we only have two minutes left, we probably should should do the wrap up. Yeah, okay, yeah, all right. Um, Jamima keeping us on course, keeping us on task, so yes. So uh, I will then take the opportunity then, I, I saw a few people um, in the chat uh, were saying how informative this was and how you know, wonderful this was and how they would like copies of the presentation. Uh, and um, I will say that uh, Dr. St. Louis will be sending uh, copies of the presentation to everyone who attended today, uh, along with a certificate uh, that states uh, that you uh, attended uh, this event today. Uh, I wanted to uh, formally thank uh, Akane and Galina uh, for the amazing information that you shared with us today. Thank you both so much. Uh, your organizations, Bagley, uh, Boston Glass, GRI, uh, doing just the most incredible work uh, before the pandemic and not during the pandemic. So thank you so much for what you shared with us today. Uh, and a huge thank you, uh, as always, to Dr. St. Louis and uh, the, the uh, staff of the CMGMH uh, for uh, partnering, partnering with the Dean of Students Office and the Rainbow Alliance uh, so that we could bring you this program today. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. Happy Pride Month. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.